much for joining us um, this evening. My name is Lily Redfield, and I am the fourth grade teacher at Georgetown Community School. I've been teaching there for seven years, um, unbelievably, and I would like to take a moment to introduce several students that we have here tonight who have taken the brave step to come and present at uh, tonight's performance. So um, when I say your name, I'd like you to please stand and face the audience. But there are 12 of them, which is fantastic. I would just ask that you save your applause till the end so that we are not here all evening. Um, we're going to start with Mr. Jackson Humphrey, who is playing George Griffith. So if you could stand, Jackson, and just face everybody knows who you are. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. Then we have Trekker Maine, who is playing William Hamill. We have Emmett Valdez, who is playing Robert Rochelaw. We have Ada Peliquin, who is playing Louis Dupuis. We have Arwen Gibbons, who is playing Sophie Galley. We have Taylor Carrion, who is playing um, W.E. Barton. We have Beckett Walsh, who is playing Charles Fish. We have Alicia Scholers, who is playing Sarah Holden. We have, well, Charlie Utter. <laughs> Kayla Berg, who is playing Charlie Utter. <laughs> we have Whittier Taylor, who is playing Isabella Bird. We have Aspen Harvey, who is playing John Tomei. We have Rowan, who is playing Roy Rosardi. Rowan Lawler is playing Roy Rosardi. And we have Lorelai Heckman, who is playing Mary Collins. <laughs> curriculum that I have had the honor of developing and teaching for the last six years or so. Now normally this is a unit that we do at the end of our school year. We do this in the spring, but because of current circumstances, I am currently pregnant and I will be on maternity leave in the spring. And this is something that... <laughs> This is something that um, I hold very near and dear to my heart. So I definitely wanted to have this curriculum be a part of these fourth graders' experience, and I am self enough, selfish enough that I wanted it to be under my leadership. So we decided to switch things around a little bit this year, and we have um, uh, been able to do it in the fall, which has been really quite nice. When you don't have to be battling through feet of snow going on these local field trips that we do, it's actually been quite delightful. So we might switch it up and do it in the fall every year this year, or every year going forward. So um, before we begin, I would like to take a second and thank our all of the people that make this curriculum possible year after year. We truly could not do this curriculum without the help of our community partners, and we have um, many. So once again, I would like you to um, hold your applause till the end, please, because just like we have many students participating, we have many community partners that we are so appreciative of. Um, we have Historic Georgetown Incorporated, Miss Cindy Neely and Miss Ellen Elliott specifically. From the Hotel de Paris Museum, Mr. Kevin Kuharik. From the George Rowe Museum, which was new this year, we have Miss Judy Caldwell and Miss Pam Ansberg. From the Hamill House Museum, we have Miss Nancy Hale. From Nyslon Anderson, Miss Cora Lou Anderson. From the Heritage Center and the Archives, Mr. Paul Vogt and Miss Christine Bradley. From the Clear Creek County Library District, and specifically the John Tomei Memorial Library, a big thank you to Libby Kaplan, and the Georgetown Trust. In addition, I would also like to have a special thank you for Mr. Earl Ballard, who comes in every year and he talks to our class about the fire stations in town. Um, I know I've already said thank you to them once, but most especially I would like to say another thank you to Ellen Elliott, Cindy Neely, and Norma Hackenstein, who were the three ladies that approached me about this um, six years ago, and without them, this would not have become a thing. So thank you so much. Obviously, tonight could also not happen without the wonderful support of students and their parents, specifically. Thank you so much for taking uh, a Friday evening outside of school hours to come and do this presentation. It really, I, I 
can't tell you as a teacher, it's like almost going to make me cry <laughs> seeing all of these students here. It's amazing. Thank you guys. <laughs> and last but not least, I would definitely like to say a thank you to Georgetown Community School. That is where I work and I am blessed to work there. Um, it's not every school that is um, supportive of developing a curriculum like this. And I really am just so grateful that I get to not only work in this community, but I also get to live in this community. So thank you to Georgetown Community School for your support. So a little bit of background about this curriculum. Late in 2018, early 2019, I was approached and began discussing with Ellen Elliott, Cindy Neely, and Norma Happenstein the possibility of creating a local history curriculum that would be a supplement to our Colorado history curriculum that every fourth grade in Colorado and um, in the uh, United States, you learn your state's history in fourth grade. Um, I was a history minor in school, and I've always been interested in local history, especially when it comes to Colorado. So it was right up my alley, and I jumped on board. We had several planning sessions and brainstorming sessions that year, and through that we created um, essential questions and goals that we really wanted this curriculum um, to, to meet. The goals that we came up with, there were three um, that we really focused on. That was one, to take advantage of the incredibly historic nature of our community. Two, to have students gain a sense of ownership over their local history. And three, to highlight the importance to these young minds of uh, the importance of historic preservation. So to that end, we ultimately realized that we were in the perfect and unique location to supplement the fourth grade state social studies standards by using the history and built environment of the town of Georgetown and the surrounding area as a living laboratory for the study of history, geography and geology, Civics, people and demographics, economics, research skills, and presentation skills. So Georgetown Silver Plume National Historic Landmark, we realized, had the capability to cover all of these different areas. And if we could create a curriculum that hit and used these different areas of study, we might have something pretty special on our hands. Um, as any teacher will tell you, when you're teaching a curriculum, the more you can integrate different areas of study, the better. Um, certain students learn in different ways. They learn through different avenues. And so if you're able to hit a curriculum through many different venues, you're able to then really try and get as many students engaged and excited as possible. So I do want to present that while I will be doing this presentation in a more linear fashion, following each of these different categories. I would like to say there is the caveat that in our actual unit, things are much more interwoven than what I'm presenting to you tonight. So we hit these areas in different ways throughout the unit. We don't just focus on history and then move to geography. They're all interwoven. So I just want you to kind of keep that in mind. Um, each year that we do this, it also kind of depends on when our community partners are available for us to go on different field trips and whatnot. So our field trips don't always go in a particular order. We kind of hit them when we're able to. But something that does remain consistent each year is that the culmination of our study involves students choosing someone from Georgetown or the local area's um, the history, and they study that person and then present as that person, which you guys will get to see to later tonight. So, we obviously could not have a local history curriculum without studying history. This is obviously the major part of our whole unit. So we spend a lot of time going over the history of Georgetown. Another constant is that we always start our unit by discussing what history is as a whole. And then we dive into the history of Georgetown specifically by creating a giant timeline. And I mean, it's massive. It borders one whole side of our classroom. And we use that um, timeline as reference then for the rest of the unit. The top of the timeline 
So the, the dates that we see up at the top or the events at the top, those are events that are happening on a more global perspective in the world. That could be um, nationally, that could be on a state level, um, but you see on the top, that's where we've got our more global dates. Then down below, we line up events happening specifically in Georgetown. So students get an idea of Georgetown's history and how it's fitting into the world's history as more of more of a whole to get a better picture. We then, as the unit goes on, will add on to this timeline. We reference back to this timeline at different points. Um, when we first start off, none of these images are on the timeline. We just have um, the events. And then students do um, an image sort, an image sort where I give them certain images and using visual clues in those images, they try and place or date the order of those pictures, which is the oldest picture of Georgetown, which is the most recent picture of Georgetown. We use visual clues like, is I-70 present? How many buildings do you see in town? Are there a lot? Are there a little? We look at the hillsides and we see how many trees are on the hillsides because during the mining time, all of those trees would have been cut down for different mining purposes. So using clues like that, the students put images in the order they think, and then once we've nailed it as a class, we then tape those images up on the timeline. So they get not only just the events, but they can get a little bit more of a visual representation of Georgetown as well. After we go over this whole timeline and story, we then focus in on 10 dates specifically, and we create a story map of Georgetown's history. So in language arts, you often see um, story arcs where you have like your rising action with kind of tension building and then a climax, and then you have your following, falling action and some sort of resolution. So we try and take Georgetown's history and we turn that into a story map. What's cool about this is that with these 10 dates, we can also look at this almost as a grasp of Georgetown's population. So the 10 dates that we look at start in 1859 when two brothers came from Kentucky and they um, got, came into this valley and discovered gold. Word got out and as a result they were able to then, um, we see some population growth. Unfortunately the gold ran out. Gold was not Georgetown's um, big money maker. The gold ran out, it was very difficult to mine, and so as a result, it looked like Georgetown was going to eventually just kind of be one another boom and bust kind of town that was happening a lot all over the mining country. But then, in 1874, silver was discovered. And when silver was discovered, that changed everything for Georgetown's history. Silver is what built this town. Um, Georgetown is often called the Silver Queen, and that is because there was so much silver that was discovered here and in Silver Plume. So here in 1864, then we see a major spike in the population of Georgetown, and things are doing very well. In 1890, the government passes what was called the Sherman Silver Purchase Act, and that act required the government to purchase lots of silver, which was excellent for Georgetown. Unfortunately, three years later, in 1893, the Sherman Silver Purchase Act was repealed. The government took back what they said, basically, and they, um, the silver no longer needed to be purchased. And this was bad news for Georgetown because our entire, pretty much entire industry was based on the silver mining industry. So from 1893 to the 1930s, you see a sharp decline in Georgetown's population. At one point, there were about 5,000 people living in Georgetown. By the 1930s, there were only about 300 people living here. And then you finally start to see Georgetown's rebirth going on. This is kind of the resolution of our story. Um, we have the tourism industry starting to pick back up. Loveland Ski Area opens, I-70 opens. World War II is done, and as a result, um, you're able to have many, uh, the automobile industry is taking off. Mountains are becoming much more accessible. And then in 1966, Georgetown and Silver Plume became a National Historic Landmark District. And that's what kind of finally solidified that Georgetown really wasn't going anywhere. So after we spend a significant amount of time talking through these 10 dates and students really have an idea of this story of Georgetown, they then take those 10 dates and they turn it into a comic strip. So they take each of the dates and they create a panel 
about what's going on in Georgetown. Yep. Again, that's just to help really solidify right from the get-go the overarching story of Georgetown so that everything that follows is then matched into that story and they have a better understanding overall. Then we get to go on a lot of field trips as part of the history of this. And this is not only the student's favorite part of this unit, but this is also my favorite part of this unit. We get to go on a bunch of local field trips, which do an amazing job of highlighting all of the different ways in which we can interact with local history. So we visit the Heritage Center and the archives, and they get to see um, how and where our local history is stored in more concrete form as well as digitally. They always get really excited about visiting the old school, and one of the highlights is getting to ring the bell. Um, and every stu student every year gets to ring the bell, which is very exciting. It's hard. It's, you've really got to yank on that thing. Sometimes you've got to put their whole body weight into it. But um, I always get a little nervous. I said this last year, and it still remains true. I get a little nervous that Georgetown's going to think there's some sort of emergency when they hear the bell ringing. And this year we had 16 students ring the bell, so I was biting my fingers, but we got through it and uh, everything was fine. So then we move, uh, after we take a look at just the, the schoolhouse itself, we then get to go into the archives. And Miss Christine Bradley does an amazing job of every year laying out fabulous uh, primary and secondary sources for the students to look through. This year was especially fun. We had um, um, Mr. Ja uh, Mr. Jackson over here who was playing Henry Neisel. He was studying Henry Neisel and he found in an old newspaper a advertisement for Neisel and Anderson and he was really excited about that because he was Mr. Neisel and he saw an advertisement. So the students at this point, we have discussed the difference between primary and secondary sources, and the archives are just a great way for them to kind of see examples of both of these. This also really helps to um, continue a discussion that we've started about the preservation of history and why it's important to preserve history. They get to see firsthand how these historic buildings can be repurposed with intentionality. Obviously, the old school uh, is no longer a school but it is still standing and it has been repurposed. It's now a community event center. It has a workstation down in the bottom of it. And so the students really get to understand that preservation doesn't necessarily mean you're preserving something exactly as it always was, that things can shift and change, but that there is intentionality behind how those things shift and change. Oftentimes, history can feel kind of stuffy and old and irrelevant, and the archives and the Heritage Center really help to show that this doesn't have to be the case. This year, we got to achieve a goal that I have had uh, for several years. I am a plumie, and I have wanted to get my students up to Silver Plume as part of this curriculum for several years, and this year, we were able to do that. We got to go to the George Rowe Museum, and it was fabulous. The students had a blast exploring all of the different artifacts that the museum holds. And then we went into the classroom and they got to experience a real turn of the century lesson with me as their teacher. And they got to write on slates and they got to explore different parts of it. They got to um, work with permanent ink, which was again a little scary. <laughs> they worked with permanent ink and they were um, using old calligraphy to pen out their initials with old pen and ink. They had a really good time with that. Um, this was a really fun for this, this year in particular because Rowan, who is pictured here, he has deep family roots in Silver Plume with its history, and he was able to find several pictures of ancestors of his who had attended school there in the past. So this curriculum, so often, um, I, one of the things that I want students to get is a sense of ownership over their local history. And when you have experiences like this and your classmates get to see you looking at ancestors in old pictures, it does help to solidify that sense of ownership over their local history. And I, I really enjoy that. So this theme of preservation, restoration, and repurposing continues when we go to the Hotel de Paris. This is always a really fun, exciting event for students because we see the Hotel de Paris outside of our window every single day. And so to get to actually go and explore it is really quite fun. As I mentioned, we have several uh, um, historic figures in Georgetown's past that our students choose to um, study. And this year, 
we had a couple that were related to the hotel. So here we have a picture of Ada. She's studying Louis Dupuis, and so she was in his kitchen. And then we had Arwen, who is studying Sophie Galley, who was unfortunately absent that day, but who got to go to the Hotel de Paris a little bit later and get to see it as well. We get to go to the Hamel House, which is another great example of historical preservation in action. So as I said, I've been teaching this curriculum for about six years now, and as a teacher, it's been really cool to get to go every year to the Hamel House and see the active restoration projects that are going on there. Since I've started teaching this, um, several things have been restored. There was new glass put into the conservatory. There's a, a new old carpet that was replaced in um, the living room area. And um, Miss Hale does a really great job of explaining to the students about preservation. And this year especially, it started an interesting conversation about Historic Georgetown Incorporated, about how grants are written, about the importance of writing grants, and the importance of shining light on the need for historical preservation. We had four students this year who had characters that were in some way represented or connected to the Hamill house. So here they are. This is Trekker. He was studying Mr. Hamill. So he's outside of Mr. Hamill's room there. Emmett was studying Robert Rochlaw, who was an architect that helped to expand and finish the design of the Hamill house. So this um, section of, it looks like kind of a boring picture, but I thought it was actually really cool because Miss Hale said that where um, Emmett is standing, that was the part of the Hamill House that from there back is what Robert Rochlaub helped to design. So he's standing there representing Mr. Rochlaub there. Alicia was studying a local artist, Sarah Holden, who has some paintings hanging in the Hamill House. So she got to see those paintings and she's standing in front of them. And then finally, Taylor was, is studying W.E. Barton. And at the Hamill House, they've got a great um, image of the Barton Hotel, as well as an old key from the Barton Hotel. So Taylor got to see some artifacts from his hotel, which no longer exists. Nizel and Anderson. This is always a really fun one. And this one is unique compared to our other um, historic field trips that we get to go on because whereas all the other local field trips that we go on really focus in on this um, repurposing of these buildings and turning them into museums and whatnot, Nizel and Anderson is a store as it was back in 1893 when it was, or 1883, 93? 83, yeah, 1883. So it's really cool. The students get to see that you know history uh, can be repurposed, but also history can last for years and years and years and years. There's a fun um, mix of old and new at Nizel and Anderson. And while many of the students have been over in the grocery side of the store with you know cash in hand, hoping to buy candy after school. A lot of them have not been over to the hardware side of the store. And so to get to go over to the hardware side of the store is always very exciting. So as I said, we had Jackson who was studying Mr. Uh, Nizel, And I, I crack myself up with these pictures. Here he's looking very confident in front of his adding machine. He's ready to add up the different things at the end of his sales. And here we see him less sure on the ladder, a little bit nervous about getting something down for a customer. So, But the ladder is always a very fun part of part of Anizel and Anderson. So geographically, we always start off our unit by discussing Colorado's geography as a whole. We create a map, uh, each student creates a map, and we divide that map of Colorado into its three different regions, and we study the, the different aspects of the regions. We then situate Georgetown within its region, the Rocky Mountain region, and we go on a creek chase where we follow South Clear Creek into town, starting at the base of Leavenworth Mountain, and we get to see how a town is built around natural geographic features. We then follow North Clear Creek back up to where it enters Georgetown from Silver Plume, and as we're going on this creek chase, we discuss town's development. We discuss the need for a water source. If you're going to have a town, you need to have water nearby. But we also discuss the difficulties of building in the mountains and the natural limit that is put on us by our geography. 
So along the way, we stop and we discuss different geographical features that we see. And then when we get back to class, we take notes about the different areas where we stopped and we talk about the different um, aspects of it. Once we see how Georgetown developed geographically, we then start to discuss its development from a viewpoint of its citizens. And we discuss the development of a town over time. So we determine the difference between residential areas of town and business districts. And we keep that in mind as we go on an architecture walk. Um, and we, we think about all of the different people and businesses that are necessary for a town to be successful. So as I said, we do an architecture walk every year. Miss Neely is kind enough to come every year and she leads this architecture walk. And we get to see where many of Georgetown's past citizens have lived. We focus specifically on three different structures that help us to see this development through time. So on this page, we see students outside of the Johnson Cabin. And the Johnson Cabin represents some of the earliest structures that were here in Georgetown. Obviously, the students see you know, that it's built out of crude logs. They haven't had the time or the energy to make those into siding. They're just crude logs. It's very small. It's a very simple shape. When students are asked to sketch this, it's not that challenging. They start with a rectangle, they add a triangle, and if they want to get ambitious, they put the, el you know, the antlers on there. But it's pretty, it's pretty simple and straightforward. So the, this structure really represents the miners who were first coming in who weren't necessarily putting down their roots. They were looking to get in, get rich, and get out. So the structures didn't have a lot of effort put into them. We then take a look at the Tucker Rutherford Cottage, which is more representative of the permanent structures that started to pop up as people moved to Georgetown and they decided that this really was where they were going to put down roots. This representation is less, uh, miners would have lived here as well, but also store owners who are starting to move into town. Um, the Tucker brothers who had this cabin at one point, they were uh, store owners in Georgetown in the business district. We start to see additions getting added on, so we get to go inside and Miss Neely always points out the different, you know, the original structure and then the additions that would have been put on as families started to grow. Um, here in Georgetown. And then finally, we go and we visit the Bowman White House. And the Bowman White House is representative um, of the architecture and that can tell us really a very strong story about the people who built it. So because the Bowman White House is much more detailed, much larger, you can tell that the people who owned it and who built it were very wealthy. People like mine owners or um, different business owners they would have built something like the Bowman White House. At this point, the students have been, you know, we start with a very simple sketch of the Johnson Cabin. The Tucker Rutherford Cottage got a little more complicated. But by the time we're in front of the Bowman White House, inevitably I have at least a couple students every year who are like, what? Like, how am I supposed to even attempt to draw this? It's too big, it's too detailed. So then we talk about breaking it down into simple shapes, into thirds, and kind of dealing with it a little bit at a time. Um, I do want to point out that this year we had 16 absolute troopers for this architecture walk. I mentioned that we typically do this in the spring, and we have dealt with some snowy and cold weather in the spring. But this walk, Miss Neely can attest, was the coldest walk I have ever done with students in my life. And they were absolute troopers. There was very little complaining. Hats off to you guys. You did a great job. When we get back to class, we take some time. It's very difficult for you guys to see, but this says, what does a town need? And we talk about what did we see in the residential side of town? What did we see in the business side of town? What are different things that a town needs in order for it to be successful? We continue our discussion of town development and uh, by having Mr. Ballard come in and visit with us. He comes and talks to us about the fire stations in Georgetown and he highlights how intentional the people living then were in protecting the town. Georgetown was one of the only mining towns of that time to not experience a devastating fire. And that was because its citizens were very conscious of the fact that fire could be 
absolutely destructive. So they took the time and the effort and the money to create fi volunteer fire departments throughout town. And because of that intentional effort, Georgetown has many of its original structures, whereas a lot of mining towns that have a similar um, founding date do not have many of its original buildings. We then, as part of this, look at three uh, Sanborn fire maps. And these maps, I'm a bit of a history and map nerd, but these are amazing. These Sanborn fire maps were created as part of this fire prevention effort for Georgetown in the late 1800s and early 1900s. And they're really cool. They offer a unique snapshot and the ability to see exactly what businesses and buildings were there during these specific dates. So we look at three dates in um, Georgetown's history when these Sanborn fire maps were created, 1886, 1893, and 1907. 1886 is a date before the repeal of the Sherman Silver Purchase Act. 1893 is the date of the repeal of the Sherman Silver Purchase Act. And 1907 is after the repeal of the Sherman Silver Purchase Act. We use that to then try and analyze if we see any differences in the town over that time frame. So each student, in order to do this, receives a role-playing card. And they get to pretend that they are a person living in Georgetown during one of these three dates. Now, each of the maps has the same roles associated with it, but there are differences to those roles language. The 1886 and 1893 maps have roles where the language and verbiage is very positive and hopeful, and the 1907 map has language that is much more negative and kind of desperate based on what has happened in the world at this point. So, for example, a student this year got this role-playing card and said the, said, the year is 1886 and you are an aspiring entrepreneur new to Georgetown. You are hoping to set up a shop and are looking for vacant buildings. What are your options? Highlight all of the vacant buildings using an orange marker. So each student receives a marker and they're looking for specific buildings on their map. This particular student was looking for VAC, which stood for vacant. And then in 1907, 1886, 1893, excuse me, has the exact same verbiage as the 1886. In 1907, the verbiage has changed. The year is 1907 and you are a struggling entrepreneur and landlord in Georgetown trying to take stock of your many vacant buildings. Where are they? Highlight all of the vacant buildings using an orange marker. After students have spent about 15 minutes with their team trying to highlight their different roles and find their different businesses, we then take a look at these maps and we see if we can find any differences between them. Some of the takeaways are that even though the repeal happened in 1893, there is not a lot of difference between that year and the 1886 map. We discuss the fact that change, even though it was devastating, did not happen very quickly. Georgetown didn't immediately in 1893 start to experience this devastation that would follow in the, fo in the following decades. Um, but more significant is the differences between 1907 and, say, 1886. There we do see that there are slightly more vacancies in 1907, as well as entire blocks of buildings that are no longer there, that used to be there in 1886. Even more significant than this, in both the 1886 and 1893 maps, there were many different milling operations and mining businesses on the outskirts of town that you can see on both the 1886 and 1893 maps. By 1907, all of those are gone. There are no more mining operations happening in by 1907. So the takeaway is really that Georgetown has started to fall into decline. The mining that was running its economics has really stopped. Maybe. Much of our discussion at this point focuses on town development and civics on a very local level. And in our discussion of government, we highlight how important local government is. Arguably, it's even more important than national government. However, we also spend some time getting an overall view of government on a national and state level as well. So we spend some time making um, a government word web where we talk about all the different words we have associated with government. And then we look at our state government and we talk about how that um, is mirrored both at a national level and at a local level. Students are always very interested to know that Georgetown is unique within our state. Our local government 
um, is unique in that it is the only municipality in the state of Colorado that still operates under a territorial charter. Meaning, instead of a mayor, we have what's called a police judge, and instead of a town council, we have a board of selectmen. And that's just kind of a cool, fun, Georgetown unique fact that no other city can, can claim in, in Colorado. So we obviously can't discuss the history, civics, and town building of Georgetown without talking about its people and its demographics. So very early on, we complete a map search. We complete a map search of uh, the state to see what different groups of people were living in history and have left their mark in the names that we see. So up north in the state of Colorado, we see um, a lot of uh, more French influence names like Cache La Poudre River, Lafayette, etc., left over from the French trapper and traders who came down from the north. You guys can't see this, but we make a really mini map of Colorado and we draw beavers up here because the French trappers and traders were coming down from the north looking for beaver pelts. And then down in the south part of Colorado, the students find a lot more um, Spanish influence names like the Sangre de Cristo Mountains. Durango, Los Animas, from the Spaniards who came from the south looking for gold. And then throughout the state, students find evidence of Native American tribes that lived here before all of them. You have names like Sawatch, Uncompahgre Peak, Yampa River, Niwot, etc. So after we kind of get a general idea of the different groups of people that lived in Colorado, we then focus specifically on the miners who came to Georgetown. Um, and are the reason that Georgetown was established and eventually thrived. So we discuss the different types of mining, the mining for gold, the mining for silver, how they're different. We discuss um, panning, panning versus hard rock mining. And the students then get to participate in different mining stations. One of those stations is panning for pennies, which is always a really fun activity. I put different pennies in and the students are looking for the older date, because the older the date, the more that penny is worth. So they're panning for pennies. Um, we then do a station where students are looking at a really awesome um, website called Clear Creek uh, Clear Maps. And it's an interactive set of maps that Clear Creek County has where you can zoom in on different parts of the county. Here we're focusing specifically on Georgetown and Silver Plume. And for those of you who are up close, you can kind of see there are a million of these yellow rectangles. And each of those rectangles represents a mining claim. So it really puts into perspective just how prevalent mining was back in the day. When the students zoom in closer, they can find lots of really crazy names. So then they get to decide if they owned a claim, what would they name their claim. They also take a look at pictures of miners and different mining scenes. And they imagine that they put themselves in the shoes of one of those miners and they write a paragraph using sensory language. Like, I smell the dust, I taste the grit in my mouth, I don't know. Right? They, they get to imagine that they're in that, um, in that picture themselves. We also get to run up to the um, Centennial Mill, which is at just the top of the road from us. And this is um, a field trip that is where I get, like, I pinch myself as a teacher. Because where else do you get to call over to your office and say, hey, we're running up to a really old mill, and we're going to be back in 10 minutes. Thanks. <laughs> you know, like, you don't get to do that very many places. And um, I try my best to kind of instill that sense of awe in my students, but, you know, I think that when you come from somewhere else and you move here, you really do get to see how special this area is. And they're getting to grow up in this area, and that's kind of the norm for them, which is crazy. <laughs> Besides the economics of mining, which we discussed, we also talk about the shop owners. And we complete, in my view, the most fun activity of this whole unit, which is called cheating the miners. Scammer. Cheating the miners. Scammer. Students pretend that they have just moved into town and they are hoping to strike it rich, but they need to buy supplies. So they go to their local shop owner. For this, um, for this activity I do, I put become Mr. O'Flanagan, and I start all of the students off with a $20 credit line. So they, in their Colorado History Journals, where they've been recording all their notes and different things, they have a page where at the top they start with $20. Then I go through different items 
and I sell them to the students, and the students have to keep a running tab of how much they are spending and what they are buying. The trick is, what they don't know is that while you can see two different uh, signs up here on the board, I only show this first one right off the bat. I make sure by the time I've gotten down that I've been persuasive enough to have students buy things so that they have nearly all of their money spent. I then reveal, with much flourish, this second sign, and I say to students, oh my goodness, I'm so sorry, I forgot that I have this whole other set of materials that are actually essential to mining, and that you're actually going to need. And so then there are cries of dismay, and the students are very upset. But I, out of the kindness of my heart, I offer to buy back some of the items that I had just sold them, but at a discounted price. So I will buy back items, but not for full price. The whole point behind this, the whole point behind this, is that while many people came to the area hoping to strike it rich as miners, this was actually very rare. And really, more often than not, it was the people who owned and ran the mines, as well as the shop owners, who were the ones who were much more reliably successful. Our discussion of economics continues as we explore three old-time tourist attractions, and we recognize that tourism has always been a part of Georgetown's history. So students are able to choose an attraction out of these three, the Sunrise Peak Aerial Tramway, which is, was in Silver Plume, the Argentine Central Railroad, which was in Silver Plume, and the Georgetown Loop Railroad, which we're all very familiar with. They create a brochure highlighting one of those three, and they're trying to persuade different people to come to their tourist attraction. I invite you after tonight's presentation to take a look. We have our setup over here. The brochures that the students made this year are really wonderful, so I, I highly recommend taking a look at some of those brochures. We also every year create our own miniature aerial tramway, and uh, this year we had a lot of students who decided to take popsicle sticks and make little pe passengers in each of them. It's really fun every year to see the different kind of themes that the tramway takes. So this year that theme was passengers on our tramway. So as mentioned, our whole curriculum leads up to a culminating research project. And students choose a person to study from Georgetown or the surrounding areas past. We use many different primary and secondary sources in order to do this. Um, some of the primary sources we use, another really amazing website is this Colorado Historic Newspapers collection where they have digitized many, if not all, of Colorado's um, old newspapers. So it's amazing. You can actually search in a search bar for different people, different events, and it will generate for you a list of different newspaper articles that would have mentioned them. So students start off our research by looking at historic newspapers to try and find their characters. Some characters are more um, prevalent than others, for sure. We also then, through the gracious uh, effort of the John Tomei Memorial Library, we get a bunch of different books um, that students are able to look through to find information about their characters. Some of those books are written by Miss Bradley here. That's always exciting. The students are, when we go to the archives, they're like, what? A real author? It's amazing. <laughs> um, but ultimately, whatever resource they're using to study, they are trying to answer these f uh, four or five questions. Who, what, where, when, and why? and they're filling out a research paper. So they're trying to figure out who are you, what did you do in Georgetown, where did you live, work, or visit in Georgetown, when did you live, work, or visit in Georgetown, and why are you important to Georgetown's history. Once they have found the answers to those questions, they ultimately then write a paragraph answering those questions. We then, get costumes put together, and we lead ourselves into this last area that our curriculum hits, which is those presentation skills. So we, we get costumes together, we spend an afternoon filming our presentations, and luckily tonight we have several historic figures here ready to present. So I invite you to please join me in a journey to the past and help me welcome them now.
George Griffin.
Bonjour. I'm Sophie Galley. I worked at Hotel de Perry for many years as a housekeeper for Louis Dupuis. I was born in 1833 in France and died in 1909 here in Georgetown. I didn't speak much English, but the kids in town loved me, and they even called me Aunt Sophie sometimes. I was well known in town, but was rarely seen outside of the hotel. After Louis died, he gave me his room to take care of. I was married to Jean et Galli, who did much of the fancy woodworking in the hotel. Louis let me have my own room on the second floor, room three, out of anywhere he could have put me, in an attic or a basement of the hotel. He chose to give me my own room. I'm important because I helped care for the Hotel de Perry for many, many years. All right, next up we have another local hotel owner, Mr. W.E. Barton. Charles 
I owned a billboard hole and a bar, bar and empire. I built a stable in Georgetown for my pack and riding business, which I called the Blue Line. I also worked in the gold and silver fields, and I would take hundreds of tons of smelting ore from Georgetown to the smelting works in Blackhawk. I was friends with the youth and even learned their language. In 1866, I met, married Matilda Nash in Empire. Ten years later, I led a 30 wagon train of party of prospectors, gamblers, and assorted homefuls to South Dakota, where I met up with Wild Bill Hickok. I am important to Georgetown's history because I own several businesses and was a trapper, guider, and prospector. All right, next up, from far off, beautiful England, we have Miss Isabella Burke. <laughs> Rosardi, 
Chris Rizzardi, Diane Blake, and Donna Rizzardi. Also had two great grandkids, Kristen Rizzardi and Lindsay Rizzardi, and one great grandchild, Bill Muller, who I hear is pretty awesome. <laughs> of our dignity, our history, our beauty. She urges us to stand together and preserve the irreplaceable natural heritage of our town. For when we act with at least as much concern for the future as for immediate gain, we will have something fine to leave here when we go. Reading these words, I wish that I could reach back in time and reassure Miss Chandler that her words have been heeded here in Georgetown. If our partnership with our community members and the interest I see in my young students every year to learn their local history is any indication, this town and area will be just fine. One more big thank you to our community members who truly make this possible and who have put in the good work to allow our history to be preserved and continued so students like these and many others can continue to learn and appreciate our past. My hope is that the units, with units and exposure like these, it will inspire future generations to continue that good work. Thank you very much. 